Good evening. I hope that you're well and I pray that uh, you're still strong in your faith. We are dealing, we are going to do our last lesson tonight about Christian ethics. And I'd like you to turn to the book of Malachi. Now we're going to, we're going to see uh, the results of uh, people not abiding by the Christian ethics that we've been uh, commanded with by God and t t t telling us how, uh, how we should conduct ourselves. Go to the book of Malachi, uh, chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 13. This is how God speaking. He says now, he says, Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, What have we spoken so much against thee? You have said, and see, God is telling them, look at this. You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is that, that we have kept his ordinance, that we may have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. Now, can you see, when we look at that scripture, we see something here that is uh, almost like an obvious thing. It's, they said, yeah, they've got the, now before before we do that, I I, I looked at up uh, I looked at the word stout. I knew what it meant, but I just wanted to, to have the Oxford definition of the word stout. Now it's, it's quite surprising uh, when you look at it. It says here, the word stout. It gives a. a, a I'm, I'm using the old Oxford, the uh, 1863 version of uh, Oxford dictionary, a very old one. Uh, that so uses scripture to, to uh, explain a word as well when, when it comes to it. So he says here, stout refers to annoyed reaction. Similar to a small insect, and they use the word a gnat. A gnat is a small insect that bites. Very irritating, especially in the evening. You feel that, that prickle, yeah, a prickle there. They're just a very tiny insect, it's called a gnat, and they, 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 they bite all the time. And it's very irritating to the skin, it causes itches, it, co it causes you to scratch all the way and stuff like that. So the, the word stout is uh, compared to that. Now, we, we in ourselves, we know of people that are uh, sometimes... Irritating. I'm using a, a nice word. Sometimes you you, you have people that uh, that seems uh, annoyed with you uh, because you're not doing what they're supposed to, what you they they thought you should do, and they kind of got that annoyed attitude towards you. And here we see that God is speaking to His people. He's talking to Israelites. He said to them, "You have said." It is vain to serve God. What profit is there that we should keep His ordinance? Now, let, let's 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 have a look at the more definitions of this word. The word stout. It says here, it's a, pr a pride, fierce. In other words, have you, uh, people? Have you ever noticed some people get? Um, aggressive when they talk to you and you don't seem to uh, do what they want, you don't have the reaction they expect of you and stuff like that. They get kind of aggressive as well. You get that? Arrogance? Arrogance is, uh, you know, when I'm speaking to you I know best you should listen to me. This is what arrogance means. And when and people that are arrogant are pri prideful people as well. It's their way or no way. Furious, in other words, also aggressive, furious. Look at this one, defiant in the reply. In other words, when they speak to you, there's almost like a, a daring attitude that they've got towards you. And this is what God's, God, this is a state that the Israelite in the wilderness, this is the, this is the wilderness uh, situation here. We'll, we'll, we'll see it just now. I'll prove it to you. Uh, God is speaking to the people that were in the wilderness. 
He said, your words were stout against me. In other words, they were in a prideful arrogance attacking God and telling God, and he says, yeah, you're telling God it's vain to serve you. What profit is there to serve you? Now you remember, how, how could people be uh, have that kind of attitude? They were in the wilderness. You remember that? You know, they were living in houses like you and I are doing. They were in the wilderness. So, the, uh, so there was a great expense, expectancy of them, expectancy of them, to uh, to see the short, shortages. I mean, they were in, in the wilderness. There was nothing to look at. And God had supplied them with manna. God had supplied them with meat, with the ravens. God supplied them with a cover for the sun. That was they were not getting too hot in the, in the daytime, and they were not getting too cold at night time because God had a fire for them, that that covered everything. So their needs were met. But God is expecting us, and this is something that I, I've been speaking to to the students in over many years. Ask yourself this question: Why do you? serve God why do you tithe why do you go to church why do you pray why do you want to behave well why do you want to speak nice words why do you want to encourage people why do you want to talk to sinners why do you want to do this why do you want to live as a Christian this is a question that we need to be honest with ourselves and I think many, many believers have fallen by the wayside because they had not the right reason to serve God. You see, when we serve God with an expectant attitude, it's exactly the same attitude you go to work every morning. You don't go to work because you love the people so much there. You don't, you don't go to work sometimes because you don't even like your work, but you, you still go there. Why? You expect money. You're going there for money. Uh, I, I don't know, very many people that go to their work because they're getting a good pay or because they're getting paid. That That's one of the main reasons. And praise God, if you are one of those people that are enjoying your, your work so much that you, you are... You know, it's never a pain to go to work, but still, you want to get paid at the end of the month. And uh, for the last 22 years, I was working as an artisan on uh, structural engineering. I went to work because I, uh, of course, I, I got paid and so but I also went to work because I loved what I was doing. I was working with my hands, I was shaping steel, I was producing something that uh, uh, somebody else could, could use to build houses and buildings and cranes and whatever. I was doing this, uh, the, 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 I was designing the structure and the thought of, you know, they are putting up, even they are making cars with the steel that I produce. That made, that gave me a, a, an inner joy that, you know, uh, well, praise God, I'm, do, I'm doing this, I'm, do, I'm enjoying my work. It's, it's, uh, 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 how can I say, it's a challenging work, it keeps you thinking all the time, it keeps your hands busy, you don't have to think on nonsense, you just do your work and enjoy your work. But of course, if, if, I, if, I, if I didn't get paid, I wouldn't go there, I would do it on my own. <laughs> but you go there because you get paid. But also, I went there because I enjoyed the last 22 years of my, of my uh, uh, factory life. And God is asking, and God is telling these guys, God is telling them your words were arrogant towards me. Because you were telling me, why do we serve God? We serve God and it's all up to nothing. It's, it's vain. It's vain. Why were they then serving God? To expect something? Were this, uh, are we in the same situation at times where uh, it says here, uh, what profit is there to keep God's law? Is there any gain for me? Do I gain something from it? Although we, we gain from it, it's not a reason 
to serve him. And I, and I told I told my students, and I think I told you I told you that before. We go to church because we love God. We tithe because we love God. We pray because we love God. We do what we do because we love God. No other reason. There should not be another reason for that. Because if there's a, a, another reason than love, then you you're serving for a you're serving for a reward, and this is not. This is not what Christianity is all about. We serve God because we love God. And yes, there are rewards. Yes, there are results. <clears throat> there are benefits. And yes, we are going to live eternally with God and we're going to spend our uh, eternity in, in heaven uh, and, and several years. And there are benefits and everything. Praise God for that. Yes. But these are benefits, not rewards. And Christian ethics... May, uh, the main point of Christian ethics is for us to understand we serve God because we love God, not what we get out of God. I don't serve God to get to to to, to uh, because of what I can get out of Him. Apostle Paul said, "I serve Him whether I'm rich, I serve Him whether I'm poor." Now I'm I'm going to serve Him, and whatever my fate is, whatever my situation is, I keep serving God. Because I love God. So in other words, even if I'm rich, I'll still serve God. If I'm poor, I'm still serving God. And that was Paul, the Apostle Paul's attitude. Now, it's, now I, want you, I, want, I want you to see the results of what happens here in Malachi 3. Let's, let's read again before we move on. It says here, your words, verse 13 of Malachi 3 says, your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet, you say, what have we spoken? And it was actually what happened. God confronted them. God confronted them through Moses. But God confronted them. He says, you know what? You guys are so unthankful. You were bound for 400 years in slavery. And I got you out there because I love you. You didn't do anything for me to come down. You were moaning and groaning and wailing and sobbing and crying. And I heard your voice and I decided, let me come down and rescue my people. And then, he, as we know, he sent Moses and he got, they got delivered. Now, I want you to understand, when they got delivered, and I spoke about it before, they got delivered, they came out of Egypt wearing all the gold of Egypt. The Egyptians just threw all the gold at them, telling them, you know what? Uh, we are, we have, we've got enough of you guys. You guys in our camps is trouble for us. So now you go out and we'll help you going out. We'll give you all the best of Egypt. Just good riddance. And the Bible says, and they came out of Egypt. Not one of them was sick. All of them were healed. All of them were clothed with better clothes than they ever had in 400 years. All the railments and the clothing of the Egyptians were thrown onto them. Then they had the gold of the Egyptian. I mean, Egypt was a, a very one of the wealthiest kingdom in, in, in those in those times, and, they, and Egypt decided. The Egyptians decided. You know what? Just get rid of these guys. Give them everything. Let them go. So they now I understand this. Why the God worked it in this way? That they they got everybody was healed. Everybody had clothed, not rags of the slave of, of, of the slavery from behind. They didn't go out with rags. You see, we look at at, at uh, Hollywood movies and we we make our own me mental picture of these people coming out with rags and all dirty and unshaven and carrying their seats on stretchers and so on. That's not the way that the Bible. Uh, uh, shows us what happened. The Bible says none of them were sick. All of them were healed. The moment they passed from Egypt into the desert, that transition caused them to be healed. Now, not only were they healed, so praise God, all the bodily hurt they had done, all the calluses from carrying the bricks and making the bricks and working with furnaces and carrying heavy loads, their shoulders were healed. Their spines were healed from carrying those heavy loads. You see, we need, we need to go into a, a deeper understanding of what, 
was the situation there so that we have a better understanding of why they did what they did. So when God says, when the Bible says that they were, all of them were healed, we, we are thinking of not only of physical hurt, but also spiritual hurt and mental hurt. Can you imagine being born in slavery 400 years? In other words, at least three generations were born in slavery. They, they had no clue. They did not know what was anything. They did not know anything. So, we have, we have this situation where God is, is speaking to him and saying, let me just pause for a moment. Yes, so, so excuse me. Uh, so, here we have the, the situation where God confronts them and tells them, Guys, your words will start against me. And then now these guys, instead of apologizing to God, instead of saying, you know what, Lord, sorry about that, uh, you know, uh, we repent as well. No, they, they were aggressive. And we, re we, we heard some of the definitions of the word start. It means uh, defiance in reply. Defiant, you know, it's like, you know, and I, I wonder if, if today, uh, we still have that attitude. Maybe, maybe sometimes when you pray and you feel God did not answer your prayer, you kind of say, Lord, what's happening now? That's a defiant approach. It's a defiant approach. It's not ethical. You would not do this to your own boss at work. Knock on his door and say, you know, what's happening now? Why, 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 why? And he would quickly tell you, listen, move, get out of my office. Uh, go speak to your foreman. Don't come and speak to me. And so, so yeah, yeah, he says, he says, yeah, your word have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet, in other words, even when I reprimanded you, even when I corrected you, you were still defiant in your replies. You were still arrogant in your replies. And you say, me? <laughs> you got that? When says, you know, this is, what have you spoken against thee? Now, this is not the, this is not, God wasn't, let me paraphrase here. I don't think God was worried about what they said more than the attitude it was said. You know, we know about body language and we know about uh, sarcasm you know the way that you say something uh, sometimes you, you might say something that is not heartfelt sometimes you would say something that is in an aggressive manner sometimes, sometimes you say something that is uh, uh, how can I say condescent And people pick up on that. People will pick up on that and they get offended. And this is exactly what God is saying. He said, he said to them, Yet you have said, Me? What have we spoken again? Uh, uh, what, we, what did we say that was so wrong? It's the way that you went to God. It's the way that you went to, against God and, and you were stout with your words. I was you were like a, a gnat. You, 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 your words were biting into the flesh. Irritating, aggressive, with the meaning of hurting, with the intent of hurting the person you are talking to. And this is the way that believers destroy each other. Because we are not addressing each other with the love that we serve God. Bible says, uh, Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you are not at peace with yourself, if you, are, if you do not love yourself, if you look in the mirror every day, you are, you are kind of upset with yourself, you kind of 
in a, in a, uh, going to a certain mood about yourself. You're not satisfied with yourself. Uh, you haven't found your place with God. Yeah, yeah. You don't know what your ministry is. You don't know what your talent is. You and you, you are looking at yourself saying, you know, "I'm a waste of time. I'm not going to achieve anything. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that." How can you love your neighbor? This is what Jesus was trying to get across. If I do not, if I can't love myself, I'm not going to love my neighbor. You know why? Because if I don't deserve love, he's not going to deserve love. You've got a defiance in our in our words. And when we get defined in our words, we get aggressive in our words. We get we are even if you, if our words uh, don't mean it, our action, our attitude, the whole surrounding atmosphere that you present. It's going to show the motors behind every word. See, we, we, need to, we need to create an atmosphere of change. Good change, not bad change. Because we are believers. And if we are believers, then God is residing within us. We are, if you believe that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then the Spirit of God is residing within me. So when I speak to people... It's like bringing people to church. I am the ecclesia. If I if I speak to people, it's like me being in a church. If you if you go to church, if you attend church, and I know all of you are doing are doing that. If you go to church, you you are you are going to be a well behaved, a straightforward, well motivated person, and that's the same attitude. That you must be out in the world towards your neighbor, towards yourself, towards your family, towards your friends, towards your colleagues. When you go at work, remember you are bringing the church to the people because you are the ecclesia. The ecclesia in the, in the New Testament means the church. We are the ecclesia. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ. So we are the church. So when I go to work, I'm bringing the church to work. When I go to my to my friend's house, for, even for fellowship, the church goes with me. And if the church goes with me, then the angels walk with me. Then the Holy Spirit walks with me. Then the anointing resides in me. Then the gospel, which is God's power unto salvation, flows out of me. But, but, if my words are stout, then I'm leaving the church behind and the old man comes out the door facing the world and whatever you present the world with will cause the reaction that actually you are producing remember people see this but they hear inside they hear your heart when you start speaking the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that even a fool seems smart if he doesn't say anything. You could have a guy standing there saying nothing, well dressed, and then you think, well, it's a, a normal, normal person until he starts speaking. Imagine, and I'm sure a lot of us have seen uh, pictures of, uh, uh, what's his name, Albert Einstein in his older age. Have you, uh, just have a look at the picture of him with all his hair like you know like afro <laughs> have a look at him now if you see a guy in the street that you think he's a beggar and you go to him and give him a few pence until he starts speaking then you realize hang on whoa what have you got here have a, have a look at albert einstein he, 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 that's a, that's the best solution uh, best example i can use tonight so he says, God says to, said to them, your words have been stout. In other words, you were murmuring against me. You were accusing, accusing me. You were blaming me for your problems. You were blaming me. You were pointing fingers at me. You were pointing fingers at Moses and or everybody, everybody else. It was everybody else's fault. It was never yours. And we, and I'm telling you now, we are finding that attitude in churches today. 
you're, you're, it's always somebody else's fault. It's never your fault. You are never at fault. You're never guilty of anything. It's other people. Although I, I know that some people are the cause of offenses, but most of the time it's our own attitude that causes people to react to what we present them with. Don't, don't, be, don't be a fool. People see through you. Be yourself. Be who God has called you to be. Be true to yourself. Then you'll be true to others. I always like, uh, what's her name? Judge Judy. I look at, I look, I look at the program sometimes. Uh, it's, a court, it's a court environment where she has to decide on, on, on cases. And, like that. and she keeps telling the people all the time, always tell the truth. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember much. And, that's, and it's very true. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. When people ask you, you're telling them the same thing you said the other day. But if you lie, then you'll have to very think hard and have a very, very, very good memory to remember everything that you've said. So rather be true to yourself. Be true to God. Be true, to you. Be true in your words. Be true in your actions. And yes, not everybody is going to like you. Not everybody is going to be a fan of you. That's okay, because not everybody is going to be a fan of them either. But we still have to be true to God. And these guys were in the wrong. Now let's go to uh, Psalm 90. Let's go to Psalm 90. Now look at this. This is where a lot of confusion is coming. Verse 1. It says here, yeah, uh, Psalm 90 verse 1, I pray of Moses, the man of God. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generation. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hast formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. Now already you can see Moses' heart. Thou turnest man to destruction and saith, Return ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight is but a yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Now many, many people have interpreted this very wrongly, uh, saying that, you know, uh, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day for the Lord. It doesn't mean literally. Understand it. It gives us a comparison of time. It, this is not literal. For example, from the book of Genesis we learn that God made this and God made that and God made that one from day one to day six. The day six was when God made man. But in, the, in day four, God made the sun and the moon and the stars and everything. And he made seasons and time. Seasons and time apply only to this planet. Understand this. Seasons and times are for this planet not outside for this planet. So when, and, and Albert Einstein proved that with his law of uh, relativity, when we go out of this planet, when we pass the atmosphere into the stratosphere, time is changing. If I, if I go with a rocket, say it's now 2020, and I go with a rocket at the speed of light. And I spend one year out in a, in a year, a year speed of, uh, in a year of, a, a, light, a light year away and a light year coming back. For me, two years have passed. On earth, 20 years have passed. 
this is a relative comparison of what God is trying to tell us here. If you stand outside, for example, the guys that are in on the moon, they can see people in the US and they can see the people in China with one eye view. Oh, there they are. The further, the narrower. God is saying to it, I am, I have no beginning, I have no end. I have no age. So time in heaven is irrelevant. That's why it's called eternity. There is no time period. There is no season because the sun and the moon will pass away. God's light will shine. So there's no seasons. And that's why it's called eternity. We are in time slot. We have in, in seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries. That's our time period. But in God, when, God, when God is outside, because it's the first, first uh, skies, the first expanse, then the second expanse, and then the third expanse where God is. The first heaven, second heaven, the third heaven. This is where God is. We have the atmosphere, the stratosphere, and we have God's world. And, and, and God is saying to us, you know what, from His point of view, Notice, when God looks at you, because He's not bound by time. And this is, the, I mean, there's so many scriptures that come to mind when we talk about this. If I stand on the outside circle of time, I will be able to see your birth and I will be able to see your death. Now, you might live 120 years, 130 years. I mean, some of, these, some of these guys live almost a thousand years. And praise God, if that's the way you want to believe, that's fine. But to God, the Bible says, my life, whether it's a, a thousand years, like Methuselah, 960 something, or whether it's a guy that dies at 60 or 70 or 80 in god's eyes my life the bible says is like a vapor now god wants us to understand the comparison between living a lifetime even if it, uh, if it's 120 years old compared to eternity a timeless frame you have got a frame of between the, the day I was born to the day I die, 120 plus or whatever. And that's, uh, for us it's a long time because we think in frames. We think in time frames. We think in, in decades. We, we think in centuries. We think in seconds. We think in hours. <laughs> Most of us who are working count the hours. <laughs> but when you're outside of the time frame, then this time frame of mine is in insignificant to God. And this is why he says, a year in your eyes is like one day in mine. And a thousand years in my a thousand years, uh, one day in yours is like a thousand to me. It's got no re relevance. It cannot be applied. There's no fractions. It cannot be mathematically uh, worked out. Why? Because I am out of the time frame. The season time have been around this planet since the creation. But God is standing outside the, the time frame. That's why it's ever, everlasting. That's why it's called eternity. There is no time frame. So this is where God is saying, He's trying to tell us, guys, from my side of view, even, even right now, 2020, this year is 2020. When God looks at me, He can still see Adam. 
and when God looks there, he can see his return, and he can see the end of the world, and he can see the whole spectrum is before him. Because he is not in a time frame. This is where the thing goes. He says here, uh, a thousand is in eyesight, how about a yesterday in the past, and a watch in the night. It's not literary. It's a comparison. God is trying to tell you, I am limitless. I am ageless. To me, a thousand years is like one day. Let's carry on. Verse, nine, uh, verse 7 of, of Psalm 90 says, For we are consume, consuming an anger. Now, why was God angry? Now, we know that. We read it from the book of Malachi. Because they were, were stout, stout against him. Um, and thy wrath, our, in thy wrath, we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquity before thee. In other words, God as, as is, is, was telling them, this is what your problem was. Your words were stout against me. You were aggressive and you were unthankful against me. Now look at this. And our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. That was the same comparison is now done again here. If a, a thousand years in your life is like one day to the Lord. And sins, secret sins are brought to the light. Why? Because again, God is not in a time frame. There is no day and night. It's only concerning the earth. Seasons, minutes, seconds, years, weeks, decades, centuries are this planet. Outside of the realm, is not time, there's no time frame. There's no seasons. There's no heat, no cold. Look at this. The days of our years of our years are three scores and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four scores, I was eighty years old. Yet it stays strength, labor and sorrow, for it will soon be cut off and we fly away. Now, yeah, God is telling that the, the people in Egypt, uh, in the wilderness that came out of Egypt, that were so aggressive in their words against God. They kept on murmuring. They kept on blaming God. They kept on pointing fingers at Moses and at God. And they were blaming every, everything beyond them. And God says, you know what? You're so aggressive that I can do nothing with you. And God told them, you're going to, and he told them, you're going to die in the wilderness. This generation shall not see the promised land. And he said, and I'm going to limit your life to three scores and five, and even four scores if you're strong enough. And that's 80 years old. And go and read the history. The old generation that came into the wilderness died in the wilderness for in the, in the, in the 40 years that they were there. <coughs> None of them entered the promised land except Joshua and Caleb because of that scripture. Now, when people don't understand this, they start preaching that God, God is going to make you live 75, maybe 80 if you're strong. That scripture does not concern us. The scripture was spoken to the people that were in the desert, in the wilderness, the people that came out of Egypt that were so aggressive to, towards God, they refused to serve God, they refused to understand God, and they, the Bible says it was an 11-day journey from Egypt to the Promised Land, and it, it, took, it took them 40 years, and they yet never entered the door. They never entered. The, uh, God told them, this generation will die in the wilderness. And out of that generation, only Caleb and Joshua were the survivors. So the people that came out of, 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 of the wilderness were people that were not born in slavery because they were out of Egypt. They were people that were born of the nation that was rebellious against God. I, I wish that we could talk more about this. 
Now where, where now where do we find uh, how old should we be? Well, we have, we, go, uh, we have to go back to Noah. And God says, because of what happened, now these guys were living a thousand years, and seven hundred and six hundred, and I mean a massive amount of time. But when the flood came, God said, I will limit man's age to one hundred and twenty years old. And this is the time frame that God has given you to live. He says you will live to 120 and if you obey your mom and dad your, your years will be added. That was it's 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 around that age. Not 75, not 80. Don't let people st steer you into the wrong things. Read the Bible because uh, you need to ask yourself questions when you read the Bible. You need to, to ask yourself a question. Who is this talking to? When was this coming to? When was this prophecy made? Has this prophecy come to pass? To which people is this talking to? Which is to addressing to what? I mean, if you if you're going to have a look at all this, you, you can't take every promises for everything just for you because there are twelve tribes and there were promises made to all twelve tribes. I'm not going to. I'm not going into this. Uh, that's another. Oh, that, another direction in wh which tribe is where today in the world. You just need to know that we we have. You've got to read the word of God. You've got to abide by what God says and understand what God says and understand that not everything that He said is directly to me. We need to. We need to know when is God speaking to me. When is God was speaking about these people? And they, they were put there, uh, Paul says, the, the, the story was put here for our examples, so that we could learn from that. Don't let your words be stout against God. And when you serve God, you serve God because you love Him, regardless of the benefits, regardless of the reward, regardless of what you might get or, or not get. I serve God because I love God. Finish. That's it. Point line. That's it. Praise God. I I pray that God will renew our love for Him. If you if you recall in the, in the uh, book of uh, Revelation, when He was talking to the church of Laodicea, He says, you know what? You've lost your first love. And that's now New Testament. It's not, it's not talking about old people. Eh? It's talking about the New Testament church. He says, you've lost your first love. So I pray that God will just make it clear in our hearts, in our minds, where our priorities are. What is my first reason to be with God? Because I love God. Never lose that. Never lose sight of that. Because when I realize and when I make up my mind, I'm going to serve God because I love Him. Then your prayer life is going to change. Your attitude is going to change. The way that you do things is going to change. Even the way that you say things is going to change. Why? Because you love God, you honor God, and God is your first primary person in your life. God bless you, God keep you, and remain in the Word, remain in God, and let the anointing of God change you and transform you in Jesus' name. Shalom.